All right, well, welcome to the seminar. Um, just to introduce myself a little first. Uh, my name is Phil. I am uh, in San Diego, California. Uh, I'm one of the pastors at a church called Kairos uh, Christian Church, and we are uh, a sister church of uh, Journey Church of Atlanta, uh, part of the Acts Ministries International uh, family of churches. Um, I actually got to meet some of you. Um, uh, last year, um, Pastor Minsu and I, we, we were able to bring some college students to Israel. Uh, and it was really great getting to meet some of you. I didn't know David was still at uh, Journey, uh, which is awesome. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it was great uh, getting to know some of you. And um, thanks for having me. Um, I know you guys didn't have a choice, I guess, but thanks to the staff for having me. Uh, just to share a little bit about myself. Um, let me just, this is uh, my wife and my daughter. Um, my wife, I've been married to her for six years, uh, a little over six years, and we have a three-year-old. Her name is Olivia. Uh, it's currently in the fun stage right now where um, they just say funny things and, and do really cute things, and, um, and so it's, it's great. Um, we actually just moved to San Diego last year, so a little bit before uh, you know, COVID shut everything down, we, um, we, we came back to San Diego, and and I say came back because I actually, um, uh, in college, I went to Kairos uh, in San Diego. I went to school in San Diego. And then I went up to Church of Southland, which is in Orange County, uh, to be the college pastor there. And so uh, last year was um, the year we came back to San Diego um, to, to serve at the church here. Uh, and, um, you know, I, before we kind of get to the seminar, um, I just kind of want to explain. Uh, first of all, I'm not your pastor. Uh, and so anything that I may say that may conflict with anything that your pastor says, um, which I don't anticipate, hopefully I don't anticipate anything uh, really being the case, but uh, please listen to your pastor first and foremost. Uh, they are the ones that God has ordained uh, to lead you and to shepherd you with faithfulness and gentleness in the season. And so, you know, if there's anything that I say that uh, may contradict what they might say, uh, please talk to them and, and um, I, you know, I yield to them in that. Um, and second, um, I just kind of want to share this encouragement as I was praying for uh, you all uh, in the seminar uh, before we were getting started. Um, I was just reminded um, that uh, in Philippians, Paul tells the, the church in Philippi, he says, do not be anxious about anything, uh, but in all things, let your prayers and supplications be made to him that the peace of God may uh, surpass all understanding and guard your hearts and your minds in our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's an important word for us. Um, you know, I, I'm not really sure, um, you know, what content you guys have been um, talking through in, in this end times uh, retreat. Um, but, um, you know, you know I, I, it can certainly produce a lot of anxiety. Uh, even without this topic in mind, uh, there's just, I know this is a season where a lot of people are anxious and a lot of people uh, kind of feel the weight of everything. Um, kind of weighing on our souls and and I'm just I was just reminded this morning um, you know God says do not be anxious about anything and, and as we lift that up to them I pray that um, you know you will feel lightness in your spirit okay so um, just to introduce this seminar um, Pastor, uh, Pastor Dandy kind of shared uh, a little bit about this retreat and um, you know he said hey it doesn't have to be about end times uh, but if it could be a word that is encouraging and challenging to the to the students um, um, kind of work around that and so as I was kind of just thinking about what to share um, I just wanted to kind of pose some uh, things for us to think through and then I kind of explain a little bit uh, kind of why these I, I believe these are issues and uh, and um, things that we need to watch out for. Uh, in our time and in this season, uh, and then kind of share some challenges for, for all of us to kind of uh, process through and, um, and, and work through. And, um, you know, feel free to chat uh, any questions you might have. I'll per periodically look at the chat uh, to see if there are any questions. Um, but we also have kind of some time for uh, discussions. I don't know if the host needs to make some breakout rooms uh, at, at this point uh, in time, but uh, we will have some time to kind of discuss uh, some things throughout. So hopefully it's a little bit more interactive. I know it's uh, after the lunch hour for, for you, you guys on the uh, East coast. And so, um, you know, if you need to get some coffee or whatever, uh, please do so. And, uh, we'll, we'll get through this seminar. So, um, four things that I kind of want to touch on, uh, these are dangers uh, that I think we must be aware of for this generation and the generation to come. Uh, and, and there, the four things I'm going to kind of go through is one is the unknowns of social media. Okay. I'm going to touch a little bit about um, social media predominantly, but even in a larger scale technology. What is social media and technology doing to us? 
um, and what is it, what is it um, causing uh, inside of us uh, that we need to be aware of. Uh, the second is the increasing polarization we see in our country. Uh, and I would go as far as say uh, around the world. Uh, it's not just a U.S. thing, uh, even though we kind of see it as a United States thing, especially now. But uh, really, there's polarization happening all across the world. Uh, the third is the erosion of truth in the public square. And I'm going to share a little what I think kind of led us to this point, because it doesn't just happen in a vacuum, but actually a series of events that led us to this point where uh, really, like, it's hard to kind of to uh, really find the truth. Um, and as people of, uh, uh, people of the word of God, we, we need to be um, diligent in seeking out the truth. And so uh, that's going to be one topic. And then the last is uh, consumer-driven Christianity and how we really need to enter to a new season where we actually put to death uh, this consumer-driven Christianity. Um, and all of this, um, you know, with the exhortation that uh, we need to stand firm and we need to overcome and, um, you know, there's a lot of things going on uh, that, that can kind of create a sense of hopelessness and a sense of despair. Uh, and yet we know that at the end of the, we know the end of the story is that um, God wins, right? And, and, and the love of God will prevail. And so we, we place our hope in that. But nevertheless, uh, Jesus says, as we are waiting, uh, we are to watch out or to be aware or to watch and pray uh, so that we might not fall into temptation. And so that is the call uh, at the, at the, on the one hand to understand the hope that we have and to be confident in that and not let the despairs and the frustrations and the discouragements of the world just weigh us down. But on the other hand, to watch and pray, knowing that there is a spiritual battle that is happening and that we need to be constantly awake uh, to, to, to be able to see um, some of this that is happening. So um, <clears throat> with that, um, I just wanted to do a poll. Uh, maybe I think I think the best way to do this might be a chat. Um, and so um, just kind of get us started. I, I want to pull a few questions. Um, what do you think? How many times do you think we touch our phone a day? Okay, two. Wow, that's uh, 100 plus, 500. 500 plus. Okay. <laughs> a lot. All right. Um, this is from a 2016 poll, and uh, I, I would venture to guess it's increased since ten since then. Uh, but I don't know if you knew this, but 2,617 times a day. Okay, that's how many times uh, we touch our phone in a day. I don't know how they got that number, but that's just. Um, how they, they tracked it. Uh, next question I want to ask you, how many hours do you think Gen Z spends on their phone? Per day, per day, yeah. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of numbers. Uh, this is from a 2019 study. Um, it's actually not as bad as some of you might think, four hours and 15 minutes, still a lot of time, but um, it's, it's uh, you know, not 10, 12 hours a day, which is a lot. That's uh, pretty much the whole, whole almost the whole day, uh, if you think about it. Uh, and then one more poll here. Uh, how much, how many hours do you think you spend on social media? Per day, yeah. Okay, I see different responses. Um, uh, this is just an average uh, from a 2020 uh, poll, uh, two hours and 24 minutes, okay? Um, but actually, you know, the, the encouraging thing is actually shows that polls um, actually show that uh, more and more Gen Zs are stepping away or decreasing their social media usage um, in 2020. And many are realizing that one, they're just spending too much time on it or two, they're seeing too much negativity on it. And so there's actually a decrease of usage uh, in social media. So um, before we get into um, the, the meat of this, I just want um, if we could break out into our breakout rooms for a, a little bit and um, maybe just discuss what are some positives or negatives you see of social media. And uh, if you want to kind of go to the realm of technology, what are some positives and negatives um, of technology? Because I think we can all agree there are positives and negatives um, that we can see in, 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 in these things. And so uh, let's take maybe 
five to 10 minutes um, in breakout rooms and maybe just share kind of uh, what we think some of the positives or negatives of uh, social media and, and technology at large. All right, I'm gonna keep going. Um, was that enough time to discuss? I don't know, it's kind of short, but I don't wanna have you, I, I don't wanna keep you guys here all day. So I'll just kind of move on. Um, but, um, you know, as, as I was sharing, uh, there's many positives, right? I think we can um, just think of all, all the positives that social media and technology have, um, have provided for us. And we were able to connect with people all across the world. Um, we we're able to be informed um, really, really quickly. And, and there's so many other things. Our lives are more convenient. Um, you know, you can order something one day and get it same day or even the next day. There's so many things uh, that um, technology and social media uh, we've come to enjoy and appreciate, but there's also a lot of actually negatives um, that uh, we, we know about already, but actually there's so many more negatives that we actually haven't even considered. Um, we haven't scrutinized it. We haven't looked at it critically enough. Um, you know, even this technology boom um, has happened in the past decade or so um, has really changed the way we live. It's changed the way we behave and it's going at an increasingly uh, 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 fast pace. Now, I know technology has been, um, you know, changing the way we live and changing the way we behave uh, throughout human history, but never before at such a rapid pace uh, that there are still a lot of um, social scientists that are trying to figure out what, what is this doing to us and how is it changing the way we are? Uh, because the, the reality is it's so embedded in our culture now that um, we're not sure we can live without it anymore. And um, we're not sure that, um, we, we, you know, I think, um, I don't know about um, your church, but uh, we, we start off the year with a, a fast usually. Uh, and when we fast, we, we t tell people to turn off social media, um, just try to unplug. And it's, it's like the hardest thing for people to, to really unplug from social media and, and, you know, technology and, you know, even watching TV shows or movies and things like that, because it's just so part of us um, that we, we're not sure we can live without it anymore. Um, but at the same time, it's like this Pand Pandora box that's been opened. Uh, we haven't fully come to understand the implications of it, uh, both in the short and the long term, uh, and the problems that they present. Um, there's this documentary. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure some of you have probably watched it before. It's on Netflix. It was trending uh, for a while. Uh, it was called The Social Dilemma. Um, and I thought it was very insightful. I mean, it, it explained a lot of the things that we maybe already knew, but it kind of went in more depth, um, just like, like all the, the ways that they kind of go about it. And um, one of my main points is, with social media um, technology is that uh, it, it creates an addiction to our phones and uh, our screens that actually leads to dehumanization. Okay, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that. But, you know, I, I watched this a few weeks ago and um, I, I knew the increasing addiction of technology and social media, but uh, my eyes were open to the intricacies of it and how actually it, it has led to uh, increased depression, increased anxiety, and uh, increased polarization. I mean, uh, we'll get into this a little bit later, but I think uh, the, the polarization we see is, uh, in reality, a consequence of social media. And uh, one of the things that they touch upon, um, you know, I won't get too much in depth. If you're interested, you should um, watch it. But uh, it's funny, I'm, I'm saying don't watch media, but I'm, I'm advertising a, <laughs> a Netflix show for you to watch. But Anyways, uh, your attention is the product that is being sold, right? Uh, you know, for you to sign up for social media, it doesn't cost you anything, but uh, their job is to monetize your attention. And so they, they essentially go into how these um, designers, uh, these, uh, their, their main role is to keep you, uh, keep your attention on these social media platforms so that they can continue to advertise to you. And so, um, you know, different companies will, um, pay these uh, social media outlets uh, to, to have a space to advertise to you. And they can get so good at knowing uh, your behavior, knowing uh, what will kind of keep you engaged, uh, that they could just keep feeding you things that will continue to get your attention uh, just uh, addicted um, to this. And so they'll do anything uh, to, to grab more of your attention. Uh, one of the guys, he's, uh, he was, um, I think he's part of Facebook, but he was saying all of these designers their one role, their role was just to design the platform so that you would stay on the platform longer and longer and longer. And these different algorithms, I don't know how exactly they do it, but um, they can recommend things to you and suggest things for you so that, you know, if you're about to tune out, they hit you with something that 
uh, will give you a dopamine uh, dopamine rush and, and you'll end up staying on the platform longer. And so uh, it's really interesting uh, how they try to grab more of your attention so that they can sell your attention to other people. Um, and the, the other thing that they said that was kind of scary, actually, is they said that they can if they can slowly change your behavior one uh, percent at a time where you don't actually realize that your habits and your behaviors are changing. Uh, it, it ends up becoming something permanent. And that's the danger because we actually don't even notice these really micro changes in our behavior that, that, that continues to change. And so if I could put it in maybe a little bit more biblical uh, language, um, many of us are actually being discipled by social media. Like we're being discipled by these platforms, what is on there. And, and in a sense, we are, um, we're, we're being um, you know, informed and discipled by what we see. Um, and and that is, that's the scary thing because it's changing who we are and we are becoming more and more like it uh, rather than becoming more and more like Christ. Now, you know, I, I know the double-edged sword is for churches, we have to use social media, right? And so like, I, I'm always in this like in, inward tension because it's like, you know, I, I dislike social media because I know what it does. But at the same time, it's like everyone's on social media and, you know, as a church, we're like, okay, this is like an avenue for us to reach people that we are ne never able, um, never, never, we've never been able to reach. So there is this tension. I, to be honest, still don't really know what to do with it. Um, but there is um, an element of, are we being discipled by uh, technology, by, by social media, or are we actually being discipled by uh, the word of God? Um, and, and so the second thing is, um, I think one of the, the benefits of um, social media and technology and uh, and all these things is that uh, we're informed, right? We can learn about something. Uh, we can learn about anything, really. We can hear about what is going on uh, across, uh, you know, around the world, uh, basically. Um, but I think actually that information overload, uh, overload uh, leads to dehumanization. And, um, you know, this is my belief that we were actually not made to consume so much bad news. We weren't, we weren't, we weren't designed uh, to, to know about all the disasters, all the catastrophes, all the, the, the shootings, all the, the, you know, the natural disasters, um, all of the, um, just the, the horrible things that are happening in this world. Now, it's good to be in the know. I'm not saying we just kind of shut, shut down to everything. But honestly, I think our human spirit can't handle the overexposure to all of these disasters these catastrophes, the wickedness, the injustice. Now, media itself is a business. And if you think about it, their job is to keep you engaged. And so, you know, bad news is actually more engaging than good news. Um, and so there's, there's this influx of bad news that actually crushes our spirit. Right? It leaves us in despair. It makes us feel hopeless. And we're like, oh man, this world is going down the drain. And like, it seems like, you know, everything you see is like this this is this got this went wrong or this went wrong um you know you know like 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 you know even just you know as an example like the 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 explosion in in beirut right like happened a few weeks ago but you know it's like really not on our minds anymore because there's already so many other things uh, that have happened since then and and i think that the issue with that is that when we are so consumed with these bad news when we have this information overload it actually dehumanizes us and um, reduces our capacity to be empathetic because we become jaded, we become disillusioned. Um, you know, clear example of that, I don't know if you do this, I, I certainly am guilty of this, is we'll like scroll past these catastrophes and oh, that sucks, but then we just kind of move on, right? And then we just kind of keep going down. And, uh, you know, initially when we might've felt uh, really um, disheartened or um, like, like we have to pray or we have to do something about this, um, there's so many things out there that, uh, we just kind of end up becoming people that just scroll through these bad news. And, and it, it really reduces our empathy, I, I believe, uh, which is dangerous. And it leads us to this place where um, there's this book by this pastor, uh, this uh, pastor in, um, I don't think he's pastoring anymore. He, I think he's more of a speaker, but uh, he's from uh, Seattle, Washington. His name's Eugene Cho. Um, he wrote this book called Overrated. Are we more in love with changing the world than actually changing it? And I think, um, you know, that slogan is actually something that we really need to ask ourselves because as we are being dehumanized, we're actually becoming people that are less practical and more theoretical. And we're more in love with changing the world, but we don't actually want to do anything about it, right? It's, it's difficult to actually, um, you know, actually changing the world is something that requires a lot of energy, requires a lot of resources, of attention. And yet, because there's so many things 
we're, we're just in love with the idea of it. And so we, we kind of think we are actually doing something when we're not really doing anything about it. And so that is a danger that we need to uh, really be concerned about because it, it, it leads us to a place of inaction. And that inaction could be for a variety of reasons, but one of it is we feel paralyzed. Like, how are we supposed to do anything about anything? Because it's just too big for us. And yet, uh, God's call for us to be the salt and the light of the earth, to be faithful witnesses um, in, in, in our realm of influence. And, you know, many of us may think we have to do something to change the world, but I, I would propose that God calls us to be faithful where we're at, where we are called to, to stand and to be in the community that we are a part of, in the campuses that we are, are students of, and, and, and start there and, and, and be practical in that sense. So uh, that's one danger that um, I, I think uh, it, it kind of leads us to. Uh, another is, um, um, I, I don't know if you guys have been um, um, reading about these things, but there's an outcry of the potential for manipulation and, and the potential for security and privacy concerns, right? We sell our data very easily. Um, the reality is when we download apps, we don't really read, um, you know, the all fine print. Uh, when we're, we, we kind of just kind of, we're like, well, you know, it is what it is. Uh, if we want to access their, this good that they, they offer, um, you know, we're just, we, we're, we, we have to play by their rules. And so we, we kind of sell our data very easily. Um, you know, right now there's like, probably these supercomputers that are um, farming uh, all of our data, mining all of our data. Um, it's really scary, actually, if you go on the internet uh, and you type in your name or whatever, you know, all your data is out there, really. And um, you know, that, that poses a concern, actually, for like hack, hacks and uh, you know, for uh, fraud and for um, um, uh, scams uh, to happen more and more regularly. Um, but uh, you know, I, 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 um, I didn't know this, but apparently, um, you, know, you think you have a secure password right now, but um, what w- would have used to take in like, you know, years uh, to crack uh, passwords, uh, they are developing supercomputers now that can actually figure out a really, um, you know, like a, like a, I don't know, I forget the, the actual number, but like a 16 key uh, randomized password, these supercomputers can figure it out. And I don't know, I think it was like a couple hours or, you know, something crazy like that. And so really there's this kind of um, outcry that there is a, uh, like as we Im- increase in our um, technology and and uh, ability to to advance things, uh, there's also all these kind of uh, security concerns that are coming up. Um, you know, with AI, we we still don't really know kind of the the, the reality of this. Um, but there's these things called the fake videos where uh, they can actually like um, put some like they can actually have a really like realistic looking video of someone saying something. Uh, that is actually not them. And, and I, I think that's going to be a concern for us uh, in the years to come uh, when, you know, if, you know, think about it. If, if you can't even believe what you're actually seeing, um, you know, what can you believe, right? And so there's, you know, all these kind of things. And, um, you know, it's social, uh, the social dilemma goes into this, but, uh, you know, Russian interference with election, they didn't have to hack Facebook. They just had to use what Facebook had already created to disse- disseminate uh, misinformation to polarize the, the nation. And so, just a lot going on uh, with uh, technology, with uh, uh, privacy concerns, with social media. Uh, and lastly, um, you know, there's a, really a lack of regulation um, that can lead to manipulation and misuse of technology. And if you think about surveillance in China, um, where um, you know, the facial recognition, uh, that's one of the ways that they're able to um, uh, really censor the, the Uyghur population and um, you know, assign people different colors where like, if you're assigned a red color, you can't travel more than f- five miles uh, or, or 10 miles of uh, where you live. And that, that's how they kind of uh, are able to keep track of where everyone is. It's, it's really scary when you, when you think about what China's actually doing with um, um, surveillance and um, you know, how they are kind of managing their population and um, you know, really the reality that China is becoming a superpower uh, of, uh, of, of this, this um, next uh, few decades uh, or so. Um, but okay, I say that all that not to like make you all scared. <laughs> um, it is kind of alarming, uh, but it's just reality, right? This this is the reality of the direction and the trend that um, our world is going. Um, increasingly uh, digitized, increasing technology, um, and and yet um, there's this book. Um, some of you might have heard of it. Uh, this pastor in uh, Oregon is called John Mark Homer. Uh, he wrote this book. I, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's, it's something that's really helpful, um, especially for those of you that feel like 
you're so anxious. You're like, your attention is like all over the place. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but our attention span has dropped lower than that of a goldfish. I think a goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds. And I think, I think a recent poll said we're at like seven, seven ish sec seconds. Like that's the, 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 the capacity of our attention span, which is so sad, but you know, that's what technology does to us or social media and technology kind of does to us. Um, but in this book, a few things I want to point out, uh, you know, technology has indeed caused us to increase productivity and efficiency. And we see that as a good thing, certainly um, in, in this uh, age, but it's also made us live increasingly hurried lives. And the reason he wrote this book is because he was like, I'm becoming someone that I actually don't want to become. And I, I'm just kind of being driven forward by this rat race. And, and we are becoming more and more dehumanized and less and less human. And, and it's funny, he, he mentions this point where he's like, he was talking about, you know, like he used to think, um, he used to admire, like, you know, when you hear about those stories of, um, you know, the, the saints of old, when uh, they would wake up at 4 a.m. to pray uh, before the sun even came out. And um, he's like, wow, that's amazing. I can't get up at 4 a.m. That's so hard. And then he was saying, um, he realized that um, actually they lived in an era where, um, you know, you go to sleep when the sun goes down. So, you know, if you're sleeping at 7 p.m., like, you know, you would, of course you wake up at 4 a.m. because like you've been sleeping for nine hours, you're like refreshed. And he's like, yeah, it's, it's, you know, if you're sleeping at 7 p.m., it's not that hard to wake up at 4 a.m. Uh, but his point is that with the invention of electricity and, and, and all of these things, uh, we've become more and more busy and hurried and uh, we want to be more efficient. We want to be more productive. And uh, we're kind of moving too quick for our souls uh, to catch up. And, and, and we become people that are dehumanized in the way that we live these hurried lives uh, rather than um, being present with the people around us, being present uh, with those that we care about, the relationships that we have, the, um, you know, your family group members, your, your, your friends, your families, uh, your loved ones. Uh, we become so hurried that we cannot become, be present with them. And certainly I, I find that to be the case. Um, you know, it, it's something that I've become more aware of where uh, sometimes I'm just so like engrossed with like, oh, I got to finish before this deadline and do this thing that sometimes I'll be playing with my daughter, but if she's just doing something that doesn't require my full attention, I just turn to my phone and I start replying to emails and, and doing things. I'm not really present. I'm, you know, kind of present, but I'm not really engaging with her. And, and I realized that this was becoming a problem. And this is certainly going to be a problem uh, for all, all of you um, if we don't kind of set some boundaries or we, we don't do things to uh, really help us remain human, uh, one that can connect with one another and one that can be present with one another. Um, there's this quote by St. Clair of Assisi. It says, we become what we love and who we love shapes what we become. If we love things, we become a thing. If we love nothing, uh, we become nothing. Invitation is not a literal mimicking of Christ. Rather, it means becoming the image of the beloved, an image that's disclosed through transformation. This means we are to become vessels of God, God's compassionate love uh, for, for others. And so the question for us is, are we becoming more like Jesus or are we becoming like the machines that we love? Are we becoming more like Jesus? Are we being discipled by the way of Jesus or are we actually being discipled by these, uh, these machines that um, we just can't live without? Um, you know, there's, uh, there's two ways um, that um, people kind of use to um, describe uh, our, I guess, our, our our, our salvation. Um, uh, m most of us are familiar with the, the Western prescribed um, kind of uh, example for salvation, uh, which is, um, it's more in legal terms, right? Uh, we, we, are, we are justified, uh, and then we are sanctified, and then we are glorified, right? You've heard of these terms. We are justified by the blood of Jesus. Uh, we are in this process of sanctification where the Holy Spirit is working on us, uh, and then one day we will be glorified when Christ returns. Uh, but there's also this, uh, it's, it's a little bit more of an Eastern uh, idea of the imago dei, the image of God, where we were created with the image of God, right? We we're created in his image. All of us have the image of God. Uh, whether you're a believer or not, we all have the image of God because we were created in his image. And yet sin has marred our image. So we live in a world where people are marred, um, people, people's image uh, the image of God within us is marred by sin. And, and the reality is we are in the process of being conformed into his image. 
okay? But not everyone will be conformed into his image. Only those that actually yield to the Holy Spirit and allow him to renew our minds and, dis and, and for us to discipline ourselves can be conformed into his image. So it's not a guarantee that even though um, you are a believer that you are actually conforming into his image, you actually have to put effort in and, and with the partnership of the Holy Spirit where you become uh, conformed into his image. And, and my point with this is, are we being conformed into the image of God or are we being conformed into the image of um, social media or what social media requires of us, what it wants us to look like, uh, these, these machines that um, really take up a lot of our time and our space. I mean, I would go as far as to say, and I think most of you would agree that we spend way more time on social media than on the word of God. And, we, and if you just think about it in, in, in terms of uh, um, how much time we spend, it's obvious we uh, will be pulled towards what the world wants us to be like rather than what God wants us to be like if we're not careful with this dichotomy. Um, some people have, been, have described this era that we live in as a digital Babylon, right? a digital Babylon where we are to fight to remain steadfast. And, you know, if you, if you know the story of Daniel, Daniel um, was taken to Babylon uh, after uh, Judah fell. And, and there's this intense desire for consecration, right? There's this uh, within Daniel, um, you know, it's, it's really amazing that, that Daniel, I mean, if you think about, you know, when Daniel grew up, it's like all of uh, Israel is corrupt and it's just like, um, there's all these heinous sins going on. And yet Daniel resolved, it says, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to dis defile himself this way. And Daniel, um, you know, he, he's taken to Babylon. Uh, they, they, they're trying to actually um, grab, their, uh, grab these uh, allegiances because, uh, you know, the way that they did it back then was when they conquered a nation. Uh, rather than just wiping everyone out, they would take kind of the best and the brightest uh, and they would actually bring them and treat them well so that their loyalty would come to them and that they could send them back to their land to kind of, you know, take care of things. And if there are any potential uprisings, uh, these people would be the ones that are able to, um, you know, kind of um, soften things or, you know, uh, make sure that uh, Babylon or, or whoever was in power uh, could remain in power. But Daniel has this resolve because this would actually um, go against the, uh, the, um, uh, the, food, the dietary laws, the Jewish dietary laws. He had this resolve not to defile himself. And as we live in this digital Babylon, um, there's a question that we ask, like, where's our resolve? Uh, and what does, what does that resolve look like not to defile ourselves? Um, again, I'm not saying just throw your phones away, throw your computers away. I'm not saying all of that, but th like, I, I'm just asking the question, what, what does that resolve look like to not defile ourselves um, and, and, and to remain steadfast uh, in this uh, digital Babylon? Um, I think one of the ways we do that is by establishing rhythms. And um, fast forward a few chapters, uh, you remember the story of Daniel in the lion's den. His opponents were trying to get him in trouble. Um, and so they had this decree like, um, uh, you know, you, you, can't, you can't pray to God. Uh, you had a, you, uh, when, whenever this uh, horn sounds, you got to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Darius, I think uh, it was Darius. Um, and, and, you know, verse, uh, verse 10 says, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem three times a day. He got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Now, this is not only his resolve, but it's actually a rhythm that he's established. I mean, for the Jewish people, this is three times a day, um, regular prayer. Uh, and, and I think that's something that's missing, in, uh, especially in the West. We don't have these rhythms. Uh, we don't have these things that kind of anchor us, um, you know, as we kind of go about. And so um, yeah, um, it, it's something that I would encourage uh, each of you to establish. Uh, are there rhythms in your life uh, where you can just come before God and, and connect with him, um, be intimate with him? Um, you know, maybe, maybe it's just when you wake up, um, you know, before you eat and before you sleep, uh, three times a day, uh, just, it, it's not so much about the quantity of time when you start out. Uh, I, I believe it's just uh, this reality of establishing rhythms that we really need to do. Um, and so that's something I would encourage you to do. Um, so, you know, this, this point was really long um, and the other ones will be shorter, but the first takeaway is uh, this challenge um, is, will you allow the word of God to shape who you are becoming? 
or, or will you allow technology or media or social media shape who you're becoming? And uh, this is a, you know, it's a reality of the tension that we face, the, the spiritual warfare that is happening uh, inside of us, okay? Um, the second um, kind of danger that I want to um, bring up is that we're facing is this increasing polarization, right? I'm sure you've heard a lot about this polarization we see in our nation uh, already. Um, perhaps, you know, I mean, if you didn't know, like, if you just watch uh, this, the, the first presidential debate, you'd be like, whoa, <laughs> like, this is so, uh, it's just disheartening. It's, it's crazy how polarized uh, they are. And, you know, I think we can kind of point fingers at politicians and be like, oh, well, you know, it's them. But really, leaders are the representation of the people. And if we look at the Bible, uh, when you kind of go through the first Kings, second Kings, or, um, or even in the judges, uh, really uh, judges kind of is a good narrative for that. But the, 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 the people are represented by the leader and, 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 and um, it's not the leader's fault. I mean, it is the leader's fault, but uh, it is a reality of the, the, the nation and the, the people that are, um, you know, following uh, or are part of this. And so um, anyways, uh, you know, there's, there's always been polarization. We get that. But there are a series of events that I think that has led us to where we are at this point that has really heightened the polarization. And it's actually emboldened people to become like this, uh, to become nasty towards one another. Um, there's a lot of things, uh, troubling things uh, that we need to be aware of. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of, it's, sometimes it's kind of really heavy. And so I, I don't want to get too much into it. But, you know, as we know, COVID, racism, political leaning, tribalism, they all kind of contributed and, and kind of fast-paced uh, kind of pushed us into an increasing polarization, um, uh, an increase, if I could use this word, hatred for the other. Um, whoever you may see as the other, there's this demonization or, uh, again, I'm going to use this term dehumanization because it's much easier to dehumanize someone else uh, when, um, you know, when you want to defeat them right? Um, there's, it's much easier, I'm mean, sorry, let me rephrase that. It's much easier to discredit or defeat someone else when you dehumanize them. Um, you know, again, we talked about how easily technology can quicken this dehumanization. Um, but another thing is we see that um, it can increase uh, polarization. And, and, and the easiest way to be nasty in public discourse is to de dehumanize, dehumanize uh, the other. And we certainly see how um, online discourse is so much worse uh, than actually in person, right? Uh, when what you see online, like sometimes I'm like, oh God, please just let it be online. Like, hopefully this is not the reality of what 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 it's like in in real real person. But you know, I, I was preparing for um, our, our Sunday sermon, and and I was just thinking, you know, this is actually the perfect time for Satan to split the church, because when you have um, a elongate, elongated period of not meeting together and not uh, really like um, connecting with one another. I mean, I know we can connect online, but it's, it's really not the same as, um, you know, a face-to-face -face relationship. But when you have this increased period of, um, of not connecting with one another, um, people can easily, uh, if I use the term cancel, the relationship when there's someone that something or someone that they don't agree with rather than connecting and and trying to have a civil discourse about certain things. Um, Satan can use that and just split the church. And I, I think we're seeing a lot of that happening. Uh, I think we will see more and more of it as we get closer and closer to uh, election. And, and that's something that we have to stand guard against. But um, kind of coming back to this, uh, Matthew chapter 24, uh, Jesus is talking about the end times. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, uh, Pastor Ryan talked about this at all, but verse 9 to 14 says, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted, and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. He's talking about his disciples. And at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And as I was reflecting on this, I realized that you know, wickedness and righteousness is not a zero-sum game, right? I used to think that was the case where when there's an increase in righteousness, there will be a decrease in wickedness. And, um, you know, I, there are certainly some cases of that, but I actually think that it, the way it works is 
uh, as we near the end, there's going to be an increase in wickedness, but there will also be an increase in righteousness. There will be an increase in the church uh, being purified, and there will be revivals that break out. And I believe that even though we see this increase of wickedness and we can be discouraged, we can also put our hope that there will be a righteous movement. There will be a purifying of the bride of Christ and that both of these will kind of increase, that the church will not be snuffed out. And, and perhaps that is one of our fears or, or something that we've thought about. Uh, but maybe the church has to go through a season of discipline or judgment. Absolutely. I do think that is the case, but it will not be snuffed out and, and the light of Christ will burn even brighter, even as wickedness continues to grow. Um, you know, as we look at this passage, it says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And I think we are seeing this increase of wickedness happening um, that, that is, is um, resulting in, in um, just um, increased hatred towards the other, uh, increased polarization. Um, there's this one podcast that I listen to called Church and Politics uh, Podcast. It's by this um, a group called the and campaign and their whole thing is um we need to allow our christian testimony our christian witness to transcend politics a lot of times we kind of are like you know it's a or b uh, it has to be a or b um but uh this um what their push is that there is a um it's not either or it's both and perhaps and and and, and one of the things that they um they they point out is there's this exhausted middle there's, you know, increasing polarized, and there's a, a exhausted middle, may, perhaps the majority that are in this exhausted middle that are just like, you know, what can you do, right? Everything is kind of going further and further left or further and further right. Uh, what can we do about this polarization? Uh, but their exhortation is the exhausted mi middle cannot give up. It cannot give up in trying to, 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 um, to understand and care and love for one another. And perhaps this is kind of what the love of, uh, many will grow cold uh, looks like. I, I'm actually not sure what it would look like, but perhaps it's this increased jaded mentality towards uh, wickedness, um, towards uh, there's this disillusionment where people are like, you know what, whatever, I don't care about uh, the other side. Um, I'm right, you're wrong. And, and that's kind of where it's heading. Um, but uh, this is, um, you know, this, this and campaign, uh, again, they, they say, allow your Christian witness to transcend the political divide. There needs to be a both and. And this is difficult because sometimes we become more and more entrenched on our side. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but uh, one of the things that the social dilemma says, is it says uh, it pushes people into their echo chambers because we actually get a dopamine hit when someone agrees with us. And so people don't like to be disagreed with. And so they will join groups or they will join um, threads where uh, people agree with them. And, and that's just how we kind of work because we get this dopamine hit. We like to look for things that already agree with how we think. And we try to distance ourselves with anyone that disagrees with us. And that, again, is um, kind, of, kind of increasing the polarization. And, and so we need to be careful with our Christian witness uh, during this divisive time. For me, you know, I... Um, you know, I think, I think what is of utmost importance is how we conduct ourselves rather than how we vote. Okay, I, you know, I, I say this, um, how we conduct ourselves as believers, our Christian witness is so important that the way we, we act towards one another, the way we love one another, the way we care for one another is a really important issue. And, and that needs to be guarded against, that needs to be uh, protected, uh, especially during this crazy and divisive time. So uh, with that said, um, uh, in, in the breakout rooms, uh, we'll, we'll just spend some time with this discussion question. How can we love one another? How can we love one another? And how can the church be um, united in the midst of this division? Is it even possible? Okay. Um, you know, don't, go, don't get into too many <laughs> arguments, hopefully. Uh, but how can we love one another? And how can the church be united? Uh, let's take about five, five to 10 minutes, maybe, uh, to, to discuss this question. Uh, and then we'll come back together. All right, I'm gonna get uh, started again. I'm gonna try to zoom through all of this. Um, uh, but um, hope, hopefully it was a fruitful discussion. Um, you know, the question is, what do we do in the midst of this division? And um, you know, unfortunately we see that, uh, the, uh, the, that the church is not exempt from divisiveness. Um, Jesus actually intercedes for the church uh, in the high priestly prayer in John 17. He says, 
uh, that the church would be one, uh, like he is one with the Father. Now, I want to just be clear, unity is not conformity in thought. It doesn't mean that there's agreement in all things. But uh, maybe uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 10 gives us a better directive on how we can still come together in unity. And that's uh, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. We show preference to one another, even those uh, who we disagree with, uh, especially in this climate of heightened anger, fear, and disillusionment. disillusionment. We need to show preference to one another. And, and we really need to learn how to uphold this d d directive because uh, the world is in desperate need of peacemakers and bridge builders in this hour. Um, there's this book by uh, Pastor Miles McPherson. He's a, he's a pastor in San Diego. Um, uh, his book is called well, the third option, hope for a radically, uh, sorry, racially divided nation. He says, God's third option invites us to honor that which we have in common, the presence of his image in every person we meet, this image of God that's inside of us. When we honor the presence of his image in others, we acknowledge their priceless value as precious and beloved of God. The third option empowers us to see people through God's eyes, which enables us to treat them in a manner that honors the potential of His image in us. This is to say, when we choose to honor others, especially with those whom we disagree with, we're asking God, give me your eyes to see people. Okay, give me the ability to see people through your eyes. And uh, one of the biggest stumbling blo blocks to this command uh, to love and honor others honor others is the spirit of offense now offense is this hindrance to honor that we have and you know sometimes uh, when we when we're offended by someone else uh, it strips away all uh, opportunity uh, to honor others right it's 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 this hindrance uh, it takes away everything that we can uh, use to honor people because all we can focus on is their shortcoming or their faults uh, we dehumanize them we demonize them uh, we leave no room for honor uh, one of my friends uh, he put it this way. He said, offense kills our ability to love. You can't love someone with whom you are offended, which is why we are commanded by God to prioritize reconciliation, forgive those who wrong us, and love our enemies. Being easily offended is a sign of immaturity and lack of character. And so, what for, you know, I, I believe that. I believe that the spirit of offense, that sometimes we hold onto it so uh, dearly that it, it strips us from the ability to honor uh, one another. Um, when I'm offended, I know that my temptation and my tendency is to become defensive and just reject anything and everything that comes out of that person. And, you know, I, I, I want to speak out against the spirit of offense because I, I think that it is something that grips us uh, really, um, really, it has a strong grip on us. And I've seen its deceptive and destructive ways in my own life, uh, as well as the lives of many in this country. And so, um, you know, church, we have to be uh, people that choose to let go of the spirit of offense. Um, we're tempted to hold on to that and, and lash out and hold on to unforgiveness and bitterness. Uh, but let's recognize this is one of the ways that the spirit, uh, sorry, that, that Satan um, uses to divide the church. And, and, and we have to struggle against it. We have to stand against it uh, to, to really ask the Holy Spirit to help us be devoted to one another in love and to honor, uh, to give honor to others. And it's definitely not easy, um, but you know, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 to 3, uh, the Holy Spirit empowers us with this ability to walk with humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And so to kind of conclude this this point, uh, this, this danger of uh, polarization, um, the question, you know, I want to ask is, will you commit yourself to becoming a bridge builder and a peacemaker? Will you choose to love and honor your brother or sister that may hold views whether it's political or ideologically different than yours um and, and this is something that we're we need to, we're constantly more aware of uh, at this day uh, the third thing um is this uh the third danger is erosion of truth and um in my opinion this is just my opinion there's been a decay of truth and trust in the truths that are presented to us uh, in our day that has led us to this cultural moment now first of all we uh, one of the things, this is, again, this is not comprehensive, but just some of the things that um, I've, I've seen as uh, unfolding in our society. But first of all, we live in this postmodern world where truth uh, is relative. Right? There's a general acceptance that your truth may be different than my truth. Uh, and so that there's no actually absolute truth. Um, so, you know, if, if we put it in mathematical terms, it's like one plus one uh, can equal two, but it can equal three, it can equal four. Uh, it can equal whatever it wants to equal depending on who you ask. Now, sounds absurd when we 
think of it that way, but that's just kind of how we've been moving ideologically. And, you know, a few years ago, I was meeting with a college student who really intrigued by Christianity and, and Jesus. And we met several times like, yeah, I want to follow Jesus. And then we, we, we talked about Jesus' claim that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And, and all of a sudden, he just became very defensive and um, uh, really offended by that statement. It's something that he couldn't accept. And, uh, you know, I think there is this, this, this reality that people are offended by absolute truth claims uh, at times because it makes them feel uncomfortable or um, it's definitely a hurdle for uh, my generation, for sure, your generation and, and the coming generations we will uh, need to face this reality now. Um, Second Timothy uh, chapter four, this is for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Uh, this was already happening in uh, Paul and Timothy's time. Uh, instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Um, and so this, you know, I think it's it's fair to say that people want to hear what they want to hear. And, and, and that's increasingly being, becoming the case, in my opinion. Um, second of all, we live in a world where misinformation runs rampant. Um, a little while ago, I was listening to an NPR podcast, and it was talking about this uh, DC blackout. I don't know if you, you saw that trending hashtag, but it, this hashtag was uh, trending because there's this rumor that the, the government was intentionally trying to create a blackout in DC. Uh, of the internet and cell phone services so that the police and military could beat up all the protesters that were there uh, without anyone even knowing. And, you know, the crazy thing was that this trending hashtag on Twitter overnight, uh, it was posted, tweeted, and retweeted over half a million times within a few hours. Half a million times. It was kind of like, oh my goodness, there's this, this thing that's happening. Now, later on, it was proven to be false, but, um, you know, I hope you know that this damage that is done uh, through something like this really weighs on people because increasingly there's this distrust uh, or this idea that, that, you know, fake news is out there or, or you know, how can I believe what I'm reading um, be, when, when all of this misinformation is ha happening? Not to mention there's also international efforts by foreign actors that are trying to create misinformation and, and media bias and, and, and all these uh, different outlets that are happening. Um, a, a poll in 2019 has showed that only 41% of America actually trust the media. 40, that's less than half of America actually trust the media. And so that's why there's this um, flocking to whatever they want to hear. Um, what, whatever outlet will tell them what they want to hear. There's these echo chambers that people uh, go into. And it, it creates this culture of us versus them uh, because there's uh, such rampant misinformation. Um, um, yeah, so, you know, like I was mentioning in Social Dilemma, um, again, like these foreign uh, actors, they can manipulate and topple governments without even having to invade the borders. And I think that is kind of the war that is happening right now where there's actually, um, it's more of a cyber war than is actually like a um, geographical war that is happening um, currently. Uh, third, we live in a, a, a society where speed is preferred over accuracy, right? People are rewarded for being the first to say or post something rather than who, who's actually the one who's uh, posting everything that's factually correct. Um, you know, news stations are certainly guilty of this as well. Um, everyone wants to come out and be the first to say something. Uh, there's this quote, I, I, people don't know who's exactly said it, but it's attributed to Mark Twain. He says, a lie can travel halfway around the world before truth is putting on its shoes. Um, now in this day and age with the click of a button on social media, you know, a lie can travel a hundred times around the world before truth even begins to put on its shoes. I mean, it's, it's crazy how everything has become so fast and it, it's so easy to kind of spread these things. Um, by the time truth even starts out on its journey, it's already old news and people are on to the next thing. Now, this doesn't bother us, but it should. It should actually bother us a lot that um, all of this is kind of happening. Um, it, it, you know, James chapter 1, verse 19 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Now, this is, you know, a scripture that we know, we, we've heard many times. It's so difficult to apply. And, and we live in this world that is, is where we need more nuanced conversations rather than less. And we need a lot of unpacking of ter what, what terms mean, what the context is, uh, what, what, what certain things mean. Um, uh, the implications of certain things, but really social media has reduced the desire uh, to engage in that. And it's much easier to just post a short pithy statement or a trendy ha hashtag 
uh, than it is to do the hard work of unpacking things. And, you know, I know I'm like blaming social media a lot, uh, but I really do think that that, that that is one of the things that is really um, increasingly um, responsible for the erosion of truth uh, in our day and age. And the last is, uh, we're actually becoming increasingly bi biblically illiterate people. Um, you know, we have more resources than ever before. We have more scholarly articles. We have more, I mean, you know, like the Bible Project produces these wonderful videos. And yet, uh, it's just like we have so much content. And yet, uh, we are becoming more and more uh, biblically illiterate. And as people that should be devoted to truth, uh, should take truth seriously. And, and as we say, we are people that believe in the word of God to be true. Uh, we need to be devoted to knowing the truth. We need to be, be more biblically literate. Now, this is more than just, you know, me saying, hey, read your Bibles. Uh, but this is a, a really a danger in our uh, generation. Um, you know, a Barna study shows that Gen Z in the U.S. context is the least Christian it's ever been. Um, and, and so we see this mission field in our backyard is growing. Um, many have grown up with a spiritually blank state, uh, spiritual blank slate. They, 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 they aren't grown up with, um, you know, Christian upbringing or Christian values. They didn't grow up in the church. And I, I think this is all the more a call for us to take seriously evangelism and biblical discipleship, um, especially on the college campuses. I think this is uh, really God uses young people and God um, uh, mobilizes people, uh, not just for the mission field abroad, but really uh, in our own backyards. God is calling us uh, to be the salt and light, uh, to take evangelism and biblical discipleship uh, seriously. Uh, but the, the way we go about that has to be uh, from uh, starting with ourselves, because we cannot give what we do not have. And if you yourself, um, you're like, yeah, I, I, I do really need to know the word of God more. Um, I want to encourage you, just jump into the word, just dive into it, uh, really know it. Um, you know, some of our students kind of ask me, like, what's the best way to go about it? My encouragement is always, hey, when you start out reading, just read through large chunks at a time. I, I, sometimes we were like, used to this Bible study method where we just go line by line. And that's fine. Uh, I think it's fine for Bible study, but you need to know the content. You need to like see the big picture, this meta narrative that is happening. And when you read it in, in large chunks at a time, um, really it helps you kind of get a get an idea of it. And, you know, sometimes people are afraid, I don't understand some of this, but let me just tell you, the more you read it, the more you will understand. The more, like more times you've read through the Bible, like the Holy Spirit will, will illuminate and highlight certain things so that you can understand it. Um, and, and so I'm a big proponent of read th reading through it. Uh, even when you get to like the hard sections, like you get, you get to Leviticus, like, you know what, like I'm stuck, um, forget it. I'm going to stop reading the Bible. Just push through, just read it, even if you don't understand it. And I guarantee you, the more times you read through these, uh, through large chunks, um, the more encouraged you will be. Not only that one, you can do it. You can actually read through the Bible in its entirety, but also it will help you just like, you'll be like, oh yeah, I remember uh, reading about this and, and and the Holy Spirit really will help you in that. So, so I'm like speaking really fast because I know I'm like running out of time. Um, so one, be slow to, speak, slow, uh, slow to speak, quick to listen. Two, we gotta be champions of truth. Uh, be diligent in seeking it out. Uh, laziness can get to the best of us, but we got to be diligent in seeking out truth. And the third is humility. We have to have humility in saying, I can be wrong. I can be wrong. But if you're going to engage in public discourse, you got to do so with an attitude of a student, right? Not dismissing what uh, you don't know, but becoming a student of what you don't know. And the last is uh, biblical literacy, um, to know the word of God um, in order to be steadfast. So um, to, to wrap up this point, um, this challenge, will you choose to be slow to speak and quick to listen? Will you be diligent in seeking out truth? Will you practice humility uh, in the search for truth? And will you be committed to biblical literacy? Okay, I'm gonna wrap up soon with this last point. Um, um, I'm, I'm gonna skip this discussion question, um, but uh, the question was, what do you think the pandemic has done to this the global church? And uh, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, but um, there was a Barna study that says um, one third of Christians have stopped attending any form of online church since COVID began. Uh, another third of Christians have said that they stopped attending the church they attended pre-COVID and have just been hopping around different churches. So only one third of the people who attended their church pre-COVID are actually still attending their church. And that's really uh, alarming. I mean, the, you know, a third of the church uh, is, is still at the church that they were in part of. Uh, but really, it's actually a reflection of the spiritual reality of what was already happening, where 
people were already in this consumer consumer driven Christianity mindset. You take away the um, the relationship, you take away the accountability, you take and you give access. I mean, everyone is online now. You can just go to any church uh, you want to. Uh, it's no wonder that we are in the state uh, that we are, um, because we already have a heavy church shopping culture, right? Church hopping, and and once there's this uh, anonymity, uh, anonymity and lack of accountability, uh, you have the perfect storm for what is happening. Um, you know, just to kind of critique Western Christianity, um, you know, I I, I want to call it a sugar-filled Christianity, where uh, we we are we were or we maybe perhaps still are in this constant. Um, constant place of word of sugary encouragement without the bitter fruit of suffering, discipline, and rebuke, right? It's like, if you just, like, if I just gave my daughter candy after candy after candy, and I, I want her to be healthy, um, that's that's the wrong way to go about her diet, right? But yet, you know, when we think about it in spirituality, like, you know, I mean, if you think about it, a lot of times the words that we receive is like, just this sugary encouragement, like, yeah, like, God loves you, and you're awesome, and you know, all these things. And, and certainly those are, are, are true, but we, we neglect the, the bitter fruit of suffering, uh, discipline and rebuke. And when we go through these seasons, we just feel like uh, disoriented. We're like, what is going on? Um, a lot of uh, Christian leaders have called for the church to enter into a season of lament. And um, for our church, that's something that we are, are figuring out as well. And, you know, like most churches don't really go through the book of Lamentations and, and we're going to try to go through it. But um, there is, you know, different seasons that we're part of. And uh, it's unbiblical to just have this sugar rush Christianity. And it shows the, the lack of death and the need to change. And, and so I do think that um, this pandemic has actually brought some opportunities uh, to the church. And I stress opportunities because they are not guarantees, right? The, the first is that the pandemic has provided an opportunity for the church to examine herself. It's an opportunity for us to really examine ourselves uh, as individuals and as a body of Christ. Examining where has our loyalty been? Where has our heart been? Who has been the God of our life? And, and, and this it's a time for reflection. It's time for deep reflection. Uh, the second is it's provided an opportunity for divine rest. Uh, for us to, I mean, not rest, reset. Uh, to reset a lot of things, to reevaluate, are there certain things that we have done that um, is, is no longer, um, you know, it's, it's dead, it's no longer able to produce fruit, or, or it's no longer uh, feasible for us, and, and we've been given this opportunity for divine re uh, reset, and last is this opportunity for deeper roots in Jesus, um, to plant deeper roots, and again, I say all this, these are opportunities, uh, they're not guarantees, um, if we don't do anything about it, um, it's, it's not going to happen. Uh, I've been listening to this podcast um, by Pete Scazzaro. Uh, it's called Emotionally Healthy Leader Podcast. And you might have read the book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. I think he has a few other ones, um, um, uh, books in that series. It's been really good for me uh, personally. And in one of the episodes, he talks about how the church may not be in the place to go wide, right, with growth in numbers, which, you know, typically we've been in this mentality that bigger is better. We need to get more and more people. We need to grow our numbers, uh, the church growth movement. Um, but per perhaps we're entering into a season where we really just need to go deeper. Uh, for all of us, we need to go uh, deeper. And the numerical size of the church may be going down, uh, but there's a pruning that is happening. And God is pruning the church so that it will produce fruit. Um, pruning is, you know, cutting off things that may seem alive, but it's, it's hindering further growth. And so God needs to prune the church so that we can go deeper. And I believe that the fruit that is to be produced is this new expression of Christianity where we will no longer be satisfied with consumer-driven Christianity. We need to put to death the consumer-driven Christianity that has been uh, so prevalent in our, our day and age. And it will take some time to get there, but it's really my hope that as we enter into a new season, there's going to be a fiery, passionate company of believers, the Daniels, the Esthers, the people who will rise up with resolve and with a uh, uh, clarity of mind and with uh, a, a, a purity of love for the Lord uh, that will seek a revival uh, for the church, for this new generation. Um, and so, you know, to kind of conclude, um, I just wanted to share... Um, a few things, but one is uh, be careful what you give yourself to. Uh, I think that is one of the things that overarching things is we, we need to be careful what we give ourselves to. Oftentimes, we don't know exactly what we're giving ourselves to until it's too late. Uh, the second is, um, you know, repentance and the softening of heart is a daily thing. 
Um, I, we depend on, sometimes we depend on these retreats, conferences, revivals, where it's like, God did something amazing. Uh, and we use that uh, to recenter our, uh, ourselves. And, um, you know, it, it's something that um, we, we need to do on a daily basis to reevaluate our trajectory. And if we're not careful, this, this behavior or this mindset, or this trajectory shifts alongside with culture based on what we are giving ourselves to. And so I always encourage um, our people, um, you know, it's not about the, the, the um, you know, the action, day-to-day -day action itself. Of course, those things are important, but really it's the trajectory of your heart. What is the trajectory of your heart? Are you softening your heart towards God or are you hardening your heart towards God? There's a difference between weakness and wickedness. Uh, that's what my pastor used to say. Weakness is, you know, we're, we all struggle with weakness. We all have things where we are, are weak and, and we go through things um, where, um, you know, we struggle. Uh, but, but wickedness is this turning away, this hardening of heart uh, that we go through. Um, and, and that is kind of the danger of that. So Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Uh, so we conform ourselves uh, not to the pattern of this world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. And lastly, scripture reminds us that, you know, we don't know the day and the hour, but we must live life with this expectation and in preparation for that. Right? Jesus says, watch and pray that you may not fall into temptation. And as, as Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, as he's preparing for this battle, uh, he goes and he says, uh, watch and pray that you may not fall into temptation. Um, and, and so he, he encourages his disciples that, uh, that, that phrase. And I, I think that's very applicable for us as well. Um, you know, this has been a difficult season. Um, many have become disoriented. Uh, I don't know about you, but um, over here, just it's, you know, it's, it's disheartening at times. Uh, many have fallen. Uh, but I think the encouragement uh, that I want to leave you with is Jesus is praying for us. He's praying for you. He's interceding for you. Um, you know, when Peter denies Jesus three times, um, he says, uh, if you remember before that, um, when Peter says, I'm not going to deny you. And Jesus says, hey, listen, before the rooster crows uh, three times, uh, two times, you're going to deny me three times. And, and Peter says, no way, that's not going to happen. Uh, but Jesus is adamant about that. But he says, um, hey, Simon, I, Simon Peter, I've prayed for you. Uh, Satan has asked to sift you like sand, but I have prayed for you. And when you have turned, go and strengthen your brothers. When you have turned, he's saying, I'm praying for you that when you come to this turning point, this repentance, go and strengthen your brothers and your sisters. And so that is the encouragement that we may be weak. We may be disoriented. We may have fallen from where we used to be or where we want to be, but we don't have to be anxious. We don't have to be dismayed. Uh, as long as we turn towards him, he is strengthening us. He is praying for us, and we are victorious in him because he is victorious. So uh, to close uh, this last takeaway, will you allow the Holy Spirit to convict you and make your heart tender before him? Will you abide in him and turn back to him even if you've fallen? Will you watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation? And my prayer for you, um, all of you that are here, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're here at this retreat. Um, I pray that it would uh, really encourage your spirit, uh, not make you more anxious or make you more dis in, in despair and dismay, but that um, that there would be a, a deeper resolve and a deeper consecration and deeper love for the Lord that and uh, this understanding that um, there is a huge battle in front of us. Uh, and and there's so there's at the same time such a great harvest um, that that is awaiting uh, the people of God uh, to really go in. Um, and even in, in your backyards, even uh, on the college campuses. And so uh, with that, let me just pray for us. Um, and, um, um, you know, if you have any questions, um, I, I guess, um, I, I know it's been long. So, um, you know, if you want to ask questions, you can. Uh, I can't guarantee that I'll have the answer. But uh, if you have to leave, um, I, th I think there will be a, a break uh, before the last uh, session. Um, and so let me just pray for us to close and then um, I'll open it up to any questions. And if not, um, God bless you and uh, I hope you have a, enjoy the rest of this uh, retreat. So uh, let me just close us in prayer. Father, we come before you and um, God, we just uh, declare in our spirit that you are victorious, uh, that, um, that as Jesus conquered sin and death on the cross, um, we know that 
Uh, we are victorious not by our own merits, not by our own might uh, or our expression of love, but uh, really because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And we hold on to that victory. And, and Lord, we know that we live in this space, in this tension where, um, God, things are not right in this world, that there is sin, there's brokenness, uh, there's calamities and disasters. And, and Lord, you invite us to watch and pray, to be diligent in uh, seeking your face, to stand firm, to be steadfast, uh, that we may not be uh, swayed, that we may not be moved, uh, but Lord, that we would remain in your love. And so, Father, I pray this uh, over my brothers and sisters, that we would remain in your love. Uh, Lord, even as temptations arise, even as polarization happens, even as uh, Satan um, looks to sift each one of us like sand, Lord, we pray that you would um, hold us in your uh, mighty hand, uh, that you would help us be anchored in your truth. And Lord, that we would be a community that encourages one another to look towards you, uh, to look to you, and to live our life with a healthy expectation of uh, uh, what you're coming to do to restore this world, uh, that you're coming to resurrect the dead, that you're coming uh, to make all things new, to wipe away every tear, to to erase sin and death. Uh, and so, Lord, we just look to you. Um, Father, I pray that whatever was spoken in this seminar that was not from you, Lord, that you would uh, strike it from the hearts of uh, everyone here. Uh, Lord, that only what your Holy Spirit longs uh, to minister and encourage within this body of Christ would remain. We thank you, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining. Again, you're, you're, um, if, you, if you, any of you have questions, feel free to ask away. But uh, if not, um, enjoy your break uh, before the last session. Uh, and uh, thanks for having me. Why is this recorded? For the, um, all of them are being recorded. Remember, Team and Sue?